Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Jack Hemingway. Tonight on our show, we're going bird hunting. Now, usually for me, that means tromping through the woods in search of rough grouse. But tonight, our bird of choice favors entirely different territory. We look for rough terrain, a lot of rocky outcrops, and the birds have got lots of points that they can sit on. They can observe potential enemies coming or going. Got to be somewhere where you're reasonably close to water, within a mile or so of water, and you're looking for typical rough terrain. For 65-year-old Marty Marash, the challenge of the terrain is one of the primary appeals of chucker hunting. It becomes sort of a contest to determine who is tougher, the chuckers or the chucker hunter. There's no easy way to hunt chuckers. You're in a constant dues-paying configuration. I am. You always have to be physically in good condition. You have to be a reasonably good shot. I choose to shoot a 20 gauge because it's lighter than the 12 gauge, so weight becomes a factor too when you're up there hanging by your fingernails and your toenails on the hillside. It's a challenge. It's probably the most difficult of all bird hunting. He says they're here. Find a bird here. Come here. Here was more. See him? For most bird hunters, a large part of the pleasure of the hunt is watching a good bird dog work. You've got to remember, he's just a pup, so he's pretty excited. But there's a bird down right in this general area here. Marty's dog, Kit, is a two-year-old Brittany. It's early in the day, and Kit is a typical pup, running off excess energy. This time, Marty finds the bird before the dog settles down enough to look. But the day is young, and Kit will get his chance. I would not hunt the birds without the dogs. Fine. Most of the training on a bird dog has got the natural inclination to hunt is, is obedience training. In other words, the dog comes on command. If you notice this pup I'm hunting with here, he's disinclined to come immediately if he's in a bird situation. But normally when I whistle, he'd come back almost immediately. It's important to take care of your dog on the hunt, checking for cheat grass in his ears and paws and watering him frequently, especially on a warm day. I've got a vet friend that I hunt with and he's always treating dogs for heat exhaustion this time of the year. The day begins to heat up and Marty chooses to hunt the shaded hillsides and ridgetops where an occasional breeze stirs the air. Now that right there, that and that, those are chucker dust beds. The birds, the birds like to dust. You're looking for the clues as to where they are, and that's a dust bed right there. Chuckers are an exotic species. This means they're not native to Idaho, but were introduced into the state by the Idaho Department of Fish and Game after careful evaluation. They are originally from Middle East and Southern Asia. Chuckers seem to adapt well to the steep, rocky sagebrush canyons of the Snake, Clearwater and Salmon Rivers. Sagebrush to a chucker is invaluable from the standpoint of a lazing area and sanctuary. It's just like a pine forest is to deer and elk. They're named for the chuck-like call they make. <laughs> Gathering in groups or coveys, they tend to fly downhill when alarmed, using gravity to their advantage. The distinctive markings of a chucker are the red bill and legs and a pronounced barring on their sides that softens to a bluish gray color. There's your chucker tracks. Your clue right here, it's you're in the chucker country. The early fall afternoon yields a profusion of colorful scenery. From the ridge top, the far off mountains dissolve into blue shadow. A moving sea of muted brown grasses conceals the bright flowers hidden closer to the earth. Bronzed and golden leaves of autumn whisper of the winter to come. The reason you enjoy the outdoor world as you continue to hunt and you continue to appreciate the geology and the flora and the fauna that goes with it, more meaningful your outdoor experience becomes. It's, it's, it's you basically and the environment that you're in. That's why, I, that's why I love to hunt this state. What do I like about chucker hunting? The one-on-one -on -one relationship between you and the birds and the dog. It's you against the odds that are out there. You're relying on your ability to know where these birds are, how to approach them, to get a handle on the control of a dog, and the ability to shoot, and also the physical discipline that goes with it. Oh, come on. Oh, thank you. That's mighty wider. For wildlife biologist Marty Mirage, 
there could be no better way to spend his retirement than a beautiful fall day hunting chucker. Just the fact that you're able to be out here and handle this habitat, you're reasonably comfortable with the hunting situation, and you've, you've got your health and you can do it, to me is the most rewarding thing right now and, and at this juncture in my life. Just being part of the scene and being able to still compete with the birds, to me, is, is a tremendously rewarding experience. We'll just garnish it with a little twig of cilantro. And there we are, we have it. We have oriental chucker with pan fried noodles. The challenge of the hunt is only part of the pleasure for Idaho sportsmen. Creating savory dishes with your harvest can be a pleasure in itself. It seems there are about as many ways to prepare a game as there are cooks. Tonight, a Boise chef is going to show us some marvelous creations that he's done with birds. It's definitely an art. You have to be an artist. It's obvious that Chef Lou Aaron knows his business. He begins with Hungarian partridge, a game bird that's a close cousin to the chucker. I'll split the breastbone all the way down, and you'll get the backbone. Even the name of this first recipe is enough to make your mouth water. Roast Hungarian Partridge Pecan Mutard. The first step is to remove the meat from the bone on the small bird, an art in itself. Just ride your knife right along the bone. Come back up on it. And you just kind of pull the bone away from the meat and it'll pretty much come off by itself. Lou lightly dusts the meat in flour that's flavored with lemon pepper and seasoning salt then dips it in egg wash. This is just cracked eggs and a little bit of water whipped together so it'll hold on to the flour. He rolls the meat in chopped pecans until it's generously covered with a breading of nuts. Okay, I'm just gonna do a quick saute brown both the uh, sides of the pecans. This is just a little bit of olive oil. I like cooking in cast iron because it really seals in the flavors. Okay, we'll cook this for about two minutes on each side. just to brown the pecans and sear the meat. This is especially important in cooking wild game because game meat has less fat than domestic poultry. The meat may be drier. Searing it in a hot pan will seal the moisture inside. Okay, now I'm gonna add just some uh, Zinfandel wine. And I'll just put it in the oven for 10 to 12 minutes at 425. This is a fairly rich dish. So Lou recommends accompanying it with something on the order of sautéed green beans rather than a starchy food like potatoes or bread. But even served alone, presentation is the key. People eat with their eyes. And if it looks good, it's going to taste good. He carves a rose from a tomato skin and adds fresh basil and a crown of celery to the plate. People Color and texture it's are tricks of the important. trade. It's very important in my business. If you have a sloppy plate, you're more intent to complain about it and uh, you want to serve something you're proud of. The sauce is simple. Ordinary sour cream spread on the plate with a sweep of Dijon mustard on top. Either plain or spicy brown, your preference. And let's see how our bird's doing. I think she's done. The meat is spread in a fantail over the sauce and the dish is complete, begging to be enjoyed. You want a surprise when you bite down, you're gonna taste pecans, which is crunchy, you're gonna taste the meat which has a little bit of, of a game taste to it, so you want to have a, the creaminess of sour cream and a, a piquant taste of Dijon mustard, so it'll make a nice blend together. Lou's next dish is spiced with a hint of the Far East. Oriental chucker with pan-fried noodles begins much like the Hungarian partridge, searing the meat to lock in moisture and flavor. This time, he uses sesame oil and garlic. It's actually what I'm doing, I'm starting the base of my sauce for the bird. I'm roasting my garlic, and I'm going to add some Madeira wine. Okay, and then I'm just going to put it in the oven and finish cooking it for about anywhere from 6 to 10 minutes, depending on your oven. I've got this at 450 now, so... The noodles are next. Okay. Anything will work from spaghetti to vermicelli. Once again, Lou heats sesame oil and garlic in a saute pan. This time he adds fresh cilantro, which is a flat Chinese parsley that has a bit of peppery taste to it, then noodles. As they begin to brown, he rounds it out with a dash of soy sauce. 
And while that's cooking, I'm gonna go ahead and get my vegetables ready. I have uh, pea pods, Julian red pepper, and Julian celery that I'm gonna saute in a little bit of the sesame oil. A splash of Madeira and a bit of salt and pepper seasons the colorful mixture as it cooks. In less than a minute, the vegetables are done. Okay, now we'll pull the bird out of the oven. And we have a reduction in the pan, that's where we're gonna make our sauce. The golden brown chucker partridge is set aside so Luke can work with what's left in the pan. And this is called a beurre blanc, which means wine butter. And that's exactly what this is, that's all it is. It's, and it's an emulsification of the butter and the, and the reduction. And you gotta watch it because you can't, you can't let it boil or else it'll separate. Here's where it can become tricky. A delicate yeah, touch is needed to keep the sauce at the right temperature. Lou stirs in butter gradually. When the sauce starts to break, he adds more wine, which brings it back together. Soon it's thick and creamy. You wanna hold that at room temperature if you have to wait till you serve it. You'd like to make this at the last second. Fan around. And I'll just do my little garnish here. You wouldn't think of doing an oriental chucker dish. The new American cuisine is, is, is that way. You combine different dishes with the traditional is thrown out the window sometimes and you use different, different ways to prepare it, to blend, to taste, a lot of experimentation. The sauce is spooned across the top and Lou adds a twig of fresh cilantro for garnish. And there we go, we have it. We have oriental chucker with pan fried noodles. Time to eat. You keep on working at it, and it is an art because you, if you love the food, then it's, it's worth every bit of it. We're blessed in Idaho with an abundance of wildlife. Even in our cities, we may have the opportunity to see bald eagle or a deer or in some Idaho towns, even a moose. But the wildlife we most often see in our city parks are geese and ducks. Take a closer look and you may be in for a surprise. A lot of the so-called wild ducks aren't wild at all, and that can be a problem. Dawn finds them gliding across city ponds, silhouetted against the still water in the early morning light. But as the darkness lifts, it becomes apparent that floating among the mallards and widgeons are ducks and geese that don't quite match the image of our North American wild waterfowl. Well, the problems with the domestic wildfowl are that they, they uh, are potential carriers of disease, which are highly communicable uh, from uh, the domestic ducks to the wild ducks. So the danger is in the domestic waterfowl spreading the disease, especially during the fall migrations when the ducks land. It could affect uh, 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 ducks and geese uh, throughout the uh, flyways in the west. The problem is that the wild birds don't have the immune system to battle the diseases carried by domestic waterfowl. Couple that with drought and the added stresses of migration, and it can become a death sentence for wild waterfowl. Reno, Nevada just encountered a problem with botulism in its ponds due to the drought in, in their public parks. And any number of, of uh, waterfowl, both wild and domestic, have died. Uh, they had done nothing uh, to anticipate this. Uh, by reducing the population of domestic uh, uh, waterfowl here, uh, we're hoping to, to prevent something before it occurs. The Boise Park System, in a cooperative effort with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, developed a plan to systematically trap and remove domestic ducks and geese from Boise's parks. Part of the success story in this, apart from, from uh, health of of uh, wild water, wild ducks and geese is the success of, of a cooperative effort of all levels of government in this area uh, uniting. The birds are enticed from the water into the trap with breadcrumbs. In the pond, boats are used to gently herd the ducks and geese toward the net. Most of the wild waterfowl escapes easily. They just fly away. The domestic ducks and geese are awkward flyers, if they can fly at all. Let's go, we need help. Once the trap is closed, the biologist begins sorting the domestic birds from the wild ducks and geese. For the most part, the domestic waterfowl are easily recognized by color differences. Also, wild ducks weigh in at two to three pounds, where most of these are much larger. This one, there's no doubt, because of the white on him, he's showing a lot of domestic. Besides that, he weighs about six pounds. 
Sadly, most of these ducks and geese are in our parks because people literally dump them here. They get them as pets for their kids at Easter time or some occasion in the spring and then the ducks uh, and geese grow up and there's no place to put them and, and uh, so they end up in the city parks. Duck is a Muscovy and they're one of the prime carriers of uh, duck virus enteritis. These are probably the biggest culprit in domestic waterfowl in urban areas. Some of these birds, like the Muscovy, will be taken to Fish and Games Wildlife Lab for testing. We're going to take a blood sample and we'll spin this down and we'll take a look at the clear portion to see what diseases this animal's been exposed to and potentially carrying. And we'll also get a general health screen on the duck to find out what kind of condition it is out in the park. The Muscovy will be kept at the wildlife lab with others of its breed for further testing. The rest of the captured birds will be used to feed the hungry through the Idaho Hunger Action Council Gleaner program. This is a regrettable situation that something like this had to happen, that, that we had to really remove animals. And, but uh, we thought if that had to be done, at least we would try somehow to have them benefit people in some way and hopefully go to a good cause. People can literally love wildlife to death. Feeding them, even in an urban setting, can be dangerous to their health. But it is possible to have a true wildlife park right within our city limits. Coming up next, we'll show you a park made for just that purpose. The key to drawing wildlife to an urban setting is good habitat. If the habitat is there, wildlife will find it and remain wild. The Morrison Knudsen Nature Center in Boise is a park built specifically for wildlife and for the people of Idaho who enjoy learning more about our natural world. A lot of times you see them flocking up and then they go south. What do we call that? Migration. Migration. Good for you. They begin to migrate. And Last spring, over 7,000 of Idaho's school children took a formal tour through the Nature Center. Another 200,000 folks toured through on their own. Can you tell me the four elements of habitat? What are the four things that wildlife needs to live? It's the first lesson every school child learns as they begin their tour. The key elements of habitat, food, water, shelter, and space. All four are found here in this urban setting. Where do you think they are? Under that log, yeah. They're under the log, right, because it's going to be a hot day today, and those fish are going to want to hang out where there's some good shelter. The kids really turn on when they're here. You can really see kids begin to connect um, ideas and how the things work in the environment and what habitat is all about, and they go, aha, and you see those little lights go on all the time. Look back down in it in those a nooks trout. and crannies. You see some big trout and you see some big sucker, it's, and they're hanging out oh, down underneath one. here because it's nice and cool. This is like looking underneath a log jam, isn't Ooh. it? So we're looking underneath and we're seeing shelter. Her. Now, what would happen if a great big blue heron came along and he sat up right up on top of that log up there and started looking around for some supper down in here underneath these logs? <laughs> they would all probably go under the log. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They immediately would dive down in underneath the log. The Idaho Department of Fish and Game, along with local volunteers, maintains the MK Nature Center and conducts the tours. It is open from sunrise to sunset and operates throughout the year. You'll find geese nesting and raising their young here in the spring. A wintering bald eagle may find a perch on the big snag in the middle of the park. Or if you're real lucky, you may see a mink looking for a fishy meal. All these animals are drawn to the habitat provided by this natural setting. But the highlight of a trip to the nature center is the chance to see life underwater. Now this is like looking into the bottom of Redfish Lake, isn't it? It begins as a mountain lake, narrowing into a stream that winds through the nature center. Along the way are windows where visitors can identify fish big and small, rainbows, browns, suckers, kokanee, and a very special Idaho native. And that's the Idaho state fish, our cutthroat trout. Through the course of the year, different species, such as these steelhead, are brought into the system so visitors can observe spawning behavior. The female preparing her nest in the gravel and the male chasing competitors 
for the right to fertilize the eggs. Look at this fish coming right at you. He's looking at you. <laughs> I like the interaction with the children. I like them responding back to me. That to me is the biggest thrill, is to see them all of a sudden turn on to it. But sturgeon will grow to be, they can live to be 300 years old, Whoa. 30 feet long, and 360 pounds. Jeez. Yeah. So this sturgeon that we have in the pond here is about three and a half feet long. Yeah, there he is, right oh, over there. Yeah, little. yeah, and that's a fairly little one. So how old do you think he is? The lessons taught here are not just for children. Leaving room for wildlife in our urban world is a bonus to everyone who loves the natural gifts of Idaho. When I can have a school group come through and then quiz them at the end, and they can tell me a little bit about what is here in Idaho, that's a real big reward. That's the plus. OK, what are the four elements of habitat again? Food, water, shelter, space. Good for you.